let the bass kick. shorts now I, I get the swiss army shorts from walmart and they have really really strong zippers on them it, it's guaranteed not to happen ever again i promise stand on me no underpants boy instead yeah well i mean that's a new character that's uh Alguine 2022 Ooh. <laughs> stay tuned yeah <laughs> breaking news uh but no everybody uh i am will and i am all by myself uh i i don't know what to do with my hands because my friends aren't here to make the awkward silence is less awkward. So apparently I'm not his friend. Well, you are, but you're also the guest. So I have to treat you separately from the co-hosts because uh-huh. normally it's like I can ramble off some stuff and get everybody going, what the heck is he talking about? And then I can just shut up and Marcus and Jay and Dr. Hoy will kind of take over and everybody forgets that I just put my foot in my mouth a- until the phone calls come in after the episode airs. And then, then I have to make the retraction, but Hey, guess what guys? I don't have a retraction to make this week. Nobody called me. Nobody called me and said, hey, it might not have been a great look for you to say this, that, and the other. Nobody. And that is a f- like, I mean, honestly, it's probably been about a month's worth of episodes that I've gotten those kind of phone calls and text messages after each one goes up online. That could be a good thing or a bad thing. At least you know people are listening. Well, and that's what Dr. Hoy and, and Marcus and Jay said on a previous episode when I mentioned it, because I did have a retraction on the last episode. And they said, well, you know, people are listening. Yeah. So that is, that. that's promising. That's, uh, it's, it's positive. It's encouraging to some extent, but only in as much as you are not just doing word salad and, and just throwing stuff out there. Well, a lot of times you don't know you're successful until you got haters. That's true. That's true. Um, but yeah, I've had haters for a long time. That part doesn't really bother me. But, you know, every once in a while, it's just, it's a weird thing to have a th- like this endeavor where every week you sit in front of a camera and a microphone and you talk a bunch of nonsense. I mean, it's like a, it's a in-depth study in communication for one thing, and it teaches you a lot about yourself, but it's also, you've got a weekly opportunity to not represent things in the best light. You know what I mean? Because this isn't scripted and and it's not a a heavily formatted show and that's by design. We never wanted to do that. We wanted to keep it casual, keep it a hang and just invite interesting people on that we enjoy the company of and have a conversation, see where it goes and promote some cool stuff that's happening and that kind of thing. That was always the goal. But when you're having a casual conversation, this is the where the the waters get murky is because in casual conversation between friends, people say a lot of things that... Maybe they wouldn't put on record to represent uh, anything that they represent or even their own opinion. I've said this many times on the podcast. The things that are said on this podcast are not a representation of any of our sponsors, any of our partners, any of anything that anything. It might not actually be an accurate representation of what we ourselves really think. (laughs) We're just talking. (laughs) So, um, yeah. So, hey, PSA, we got all that out of the way. Now we can... Move on to the, the good stuff. You've got some exciting stuff going on. Uh, for those of you that who aren't familiar with our guests this week, uh, first, thank you for tuning in to episode 34. I am Will. This is The Last Cash, and this is my friend, Shantae de Silva Cox. Hey, golf snap. <laughs> Nobody else to do golf snaps with. That's a problem. Um, I, miss my, I miss my boys. Um, but no, you have been a guest on our show many times. We, we are dear friends. You are... Um, as of this year, you are now, what is your position with Music City Disc Golf? Because you are on the board of directors. Yeah, I'm the public relations officer. Public relations officer, as well you should be. <laughs> uh, but for anybody else that's tuning in into the show, you're not familiar with Shantae. Uh, not only is she a, a member of the board of directors for Music City Disc Golf, one of the largest clubs in the country and the local club here in Nashville, but she's also a, uh, I mean, to say a talented visual artist is like the understatement of the century. You've been doing stamps, trophies, all sorts of visual artwork, uh, t-shirt logos, all sorts of stuff for not only the club, but for my events yeah. and a lot of events in the area and elsewhere as of the last year or two. Mm-hmm. And you just keep adding more and more things to your portfolio. And you are 
I mean, it's kind of a, at, a, at a point now where if it's a visual art of some kind and, it, and disc golf related or no, you're, you've got your fingers in it. Yeah, I got, I'm now uh, currently in eight countries and in 34 U.S. states. Golly. <laughs> Golly. Um, I know your first international project was uh, the Korea mm-hmm. Disc Golf Club. It, tell, tell everybody a little bit more about that. Yes, yeah, so we have um, a military installation in Korea, mm-hmm. um, and uh, there's a disc golf club there. And um, I got involved doing the bag tags for them, like creating the bag tags. Um, I joined in with uh, my husband Nathan Cox, and um, he runs the uh, the club there. So he'll throw the tournament, and I provide um, the stamp for it and any other goodies that you know we um, you know I give towards the the club. Um, and then we have sponsored players as well there now. That is awesome. Sponsored by the Ace Line or mm-hmm. Enchante Ace Creations? Line. No, my by Ace Line, yeah. So Ace is um, Air Chains Earth um, International Disc Golf. And we have currently we have uh, 40 sponsored players uh, internationally. Um, we have one in Africa, Uganda, uh, Sweden, Korea, and then lots in the United States. And we even have one in Canada. That is intense. Yeah. You are covering all the bases. Yeah, we have children, we have women, and we have men. So you mentioned a couple different places in Africa, and I have, I'm a little familiar with the the disc golf in Africa, uh, that in whole Egypt. initiative. Okay, yeah. in Egypt. Yeah, in Egypt. In Egypt and Uganda. Yep. Okay. Well, that's huge. Yeah, yeah. It was um, just a few, you know, like one gentleman that um, put some orders in through for some local girls, so um, that he's starting uh, some disc golf there. So That's awesome. Yeah. Are you familiar with uh, Johannes? Yes. Desalina and them? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah the, I remember when he when he first started his whole initiative there at Asosi University in Ethiopia, uh, I was immediately, I was just like, this kid is something. I mean, I, I, read, I, I identified with him a lot because of basically trying to take something that wasn't successful and make something out of it or, you know, or, or, or trying to make disc golf into like using it for a new, I don't know, uh, medium or leverage point or something like that for the good of the of a yeah, community it seems like kind of like more of like a social like you know it's social for us but it's actually more social for them and like helping them get away from their home environment and yeah. have something positive and give them some resources and stuff like that so i i know it's growing like a more of a like, like giving them care packages as well mm-hmm. with a disc and stuff like that. well and it's incredibly hard to do because International shipping is a nightmare under normal circumstances. You add a global pandemic into the mix. And I know just from my conversations with people that have done any kind of business with uh, the disc golf scene in Africa, you almost like you can't really ship anything to a lot of these places and have any kind of level of confidence that it's going to make it to its destination. Like pretty much that you have, you need to make contact with somebody that is traveling there in some form or fashion in tandem with the objects that you're sending to kind of be a steward Absolutely. of the shipment and make sure it makes it to where it's going. Yeah. Uh, and that, that's probably a, a geopolitical uh, element to, you know, not just a logistics thing, but it's, but I mean, can you think of anything more worthwhile? I mean, yeah. to bring d- disc golf into a place like that, you know, I mean, obviously we have places in our backyard like that we that it can do good in Mm -hmm. but i mean that's like you talk about um how what an impact something like uh, clean water you know you there's all sorts of nonprofits and charities that are totally centered around bringing clean water to these impoverished areas in africa and that's obviously a very real universal struggle and it's a it's a necessity for human life but some there's some other intangible things that aren't necessarily like a necessity for human life, but that are a necessity for quality of life Mm -hmm. that disc golf gives access to for a a lot of them. Yeah. And I think we saw that um, during the pandemic and the lockdown the most Mm -hmm. is people really got a sense of realizing what they needed in their life and what they didn't need in their life and what was important and wasn't important. And as much as people, um, I was actually having this conversation with my kids um, the other day. And they were talking about VR games and how like people might just stay home and and stay in their VR all day long and like never want to have a life and not join reality. And um, 
And I told him, you know what, I don't agree with that. They're going to do that because they showed us during, you know, after the lockdown that people couldn't wait to socialize in person again. They couldn't wait for human interaction. And it just really, I think, made people appreciate so much more, you know, what we do have. Um, you know, we start seeing people like think about disc golf. We've had the biggest influx in disc golf ever during this, you know, situation because it's a social you know, we can social distance, we can, you know, we're, we're, we can be safe, um, we can get out inside. And, you know, I think it was the perfect time, you know, for this, this sport to like really shine, mm -hmm. you know. Absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's one of those things where normally we're used to such a, a long game kind of slow burn approach to this where we're, we're grinding our asses off constantly trying to grow the sport and make the industry viable and we're all kind of given or resigned to the idea that it's just going to take time and then all of a sudden some circumstances that are unforeseen and beyond our control cause the cork to come out mm -hmm. and uh and now we've got a lot of growing pains and we're trying to play catch up to a large extent with in many areas of the business of disc mm -hmm. golf so but it also creates a really unique opportunity for people such as yourself that have that are enterprising and industrious and have some really good ideas and a deep, robust and diversified skill set. Because you have you, what you, I mean, this is what I'm always telling people is like one, you either need a really good idea that nobody else is doing yet, or you need to be doing something that somebody else is doing and find a better way to do it. You know, and you, you just, you've got ideas falling out of your ears <laughs> and you're doing all of them. You're actually, I mean, like these aren't things that you're just spouting off and they're falling way into the ether. You're following through. You've got all these different lines. You've got the eight, the air chains, earth line, um, the disc maidens line. You are now doing the custom dies. You do trophies, you do hot stamps, you do logos, um, you do resin minis, these really awesome with all sorts of different materials in them. Uh, mini markers you're doing. I don't know. It's probably easier to say what you're not doing, <laughs> but uh, what are you currently? What is your bread and butter? Would you say it's the custom dies? Would you say it's uh, what is what are the things that are really paint? Like, I mean, I, I don't know that you're not necessarily at a point where disc golf is paying the bills, but. I know that this is becoming a lucrative thing for you and it's, yeah. and, you know, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's finally, you're starting to see the dividends of your investment. Yeah. Um, as an artist, it's, it's one of those things that's difficult where you, you try to line between where the demand is and where your audience is and where you individually want it to, to be, um, where my absolute passion and shine really, really is, is in sculpting you know, um, creating, um, a sculpture from 250 pieces of driftwood, you know, or, or more, um, and just creating an entire, you know, animal or something out of nothing, you know, um, creating treasure from garbage is pretty much my like real passion. Um, just because I like to see the potential in everything and, um, I like to create something from nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I that's, think that's the definition of of, an, of art. Yeah. yeah, create something that wasn't there before. Exactly, and with disc, it's um, also what separates people from other animals. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we, yeah. we we just come up with these harebrained ideas, and then we uh, we actually make real, tangible representations of them, or yeah. make them manifest. Yeah, and uh, disc were fascinating to me because um, I look at them like a, a tattoo artist does, and um, I've designed my own tattoos, so. I kind of already understood how to create an image, you know, with using the negative of your, or not really negative, but your skin color, you know, as you're white, because you don't really add white to a tattoo. Yeah. You can, but it's going to fade. So you really have to design with the skin being your light. So with the disc, it's the exact same way. You have to plan backwards. You can't add white. So your everything that's light and white has to be, stays there. You can't add it. So you can't highlight later. You can't do anything like that. So that's been like for me a challenge to change my art. You can't erase, you know, like once you make commit, you know, that die to that disc, it's not going anywhere. 
you know, or you have to change your whole thing. So those kind of things for me have been like a challenge where I thought, yeah, you know what, I, I can keep doing this. I think I can figure this out. And then um, after I introduced science, which, you know, um, yeah, I'm an artist, but my biggest trait is not my art. It's actually my brain. And like, you know, um, in all the business I do and even computer programming and everything else that I have done in the past um, has been really where I excel. So by taking that science part and mixing it with my art, I became kind of like a little mad scientist in the lab. And so with the resin, I... What are we going to do tonight, Shantae? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. The same thing we do every night, Becky. I know. Try to take over the world. Turn down the lights and see what I come up with. That was always the joke between me and Alan Posey. It was... We were pinky in the brain. Oh, yeah, you guys. I was like, hey, what are we going to do today, Alan? You guys fit that. Yeah. But, you know, it's it's nice because um, everything I do, if, if pretty much all my art, there's a, there's a mathematical thing to it. Whether um, I'm adding acetone and chemicals to and heat and changing all these different you know compositions in order to create what I want using mediums that people don't necessarily normally use because it's really hard to control Mm -hmm. um I use airbrushes on um the dyes um mostly that and okay let me push pause because I I want to you're you're getting into all sorts of stuff that I do want to get more detailed with on you Mm -hmm. Or with you, detailed on with you. Yeah, let's let's make that clear. Um, the and and I'm going to go out on a limb here and maybe put words in your mouth. But would you say that the difficulty that you had there, or the challenge that you felt that you found there, I'm gathering that it was unexpected. Like the the stamp work was a little bit more challenging than you anticipated. Is that because your mind works? typically in such a complicated fashion and you're normally kind of working through really complicated re- visual representations of things. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you've got to really pump the brakes and simplify because like you said, that's the thing that a lot of people don't understand. If you're making a hot stamp, it has to be, it's black and white. It's, you know, you, you have to take the grandeur of your idea and package it in, in a really simple and streamlined. Well, you and I both have personal experience with, I mean, you were the first person I ever did a hot stamp for. So, um, working together to figure out, like, how do I turn art into a stamp? Like, coming up with how to do that, that was, you know, a technique in itself. You know, because I sketched something on my iPad, but that you can't turn that into a stamp. And now, now that we've kind of uh, caught up, I would like you, I'm going to solo on you and hold up uh, the, the uh, Pennywise. Let's do Pennywise first. This is the die, and there's your camera right there if you want to hold it up close to that camera. You guys can really see the detail on this. These, I was telling you before the show, these lines and these and the fading, the shading, it's so clean. It's so precise. It's, And I remember when you first started doing the dies, and you would almost think that for a, a visual artist that's getting into the disc golf industry, that that would be the first place somebody would go. And that there's already an established market for custom dies mm-hmm. and that kind of artwork within the, within the sport of disc golf. But you did just about everything else first. You were making trophies and these awesome resin minis and, and you were doing apparel. You had the air chains earth and the disc maidens and all that stuff. And then you started doing the dyes. And I remember when you started Ooh. doing it, the first month or so of I you... I actually did dyes way before all that. Okay. Yeah. If you look back, like, the reason I stopped was the whole science thing. So I didn't... There's a way that people are doing dyes out there. Like, you'll see kind of the same type of dyes. You know, people have perfected it in incredible, you know, ways to do the lotions and the glue beds and, and all those kind of things. Um, but I didn't want to do that. Like, I didn't want to do what everybody does. So um, I wanted to take my art to another level. And I was using the iDye Poly, which for those of you who don't know what that is, it's a a fabric for polyesters and synthetics that comes in a powder form. And you take that powder and you got to add it. to. You're getting a little far away from your mic. You got to add that. You can bring the mic with you, remember. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I got to like. And you can pull it down. You can like crank on this thing. I don't know. Audience, you can see what I'm doing here. This is not going to hurting any. I'm just kidding. (laughs) Until he hits himself and knocks himself out. (laughs) 
But no, uh, I want you to be comfortable, but I want everybody to be able to hear you. Okay, is that good? And I also don't want the editing to take me four days. So, All right, sounds um, good. Yeah. Let's, let's just make that deal. Okay. All right. I will make sure I pay attention. And don't feel like I'm picking on you because it, it is a really, really hard thing to wrap your head around and be constantly aware of. Um, I, yeah. It took me about two years to get used to it. I got to stay right here no matter where I go. Um, there we go. I'm not going to edit any of this out uh, either. I'm just going to leave it here for framing. Um, so so what happened was is that what well, so, happened was yeah so you use this powder form and you add acetone or alcohol or water everybody has a different method to their madness um well it's a powder so when i'm adding that powder with any liquid to my airbrushes it was quickly clogging my airbrushes because the whatever liquid was in it was evaporating really fast from the air being pushed through the airbrush evaporating it and then that powder would clog my airbrush so I was not able to achieve what I was trying to achieve. Now, I, I did achieve a, a very, you know, elementary version of what I'm doing right now. And you can, and there is the evidence of it on my Instagram, so you can see it, that it was very, you know, um, basic. But um, I just got sick of it because I was just like, this isn't what I want. I couldn't achieve what my mind wanted. So I tried to just find something else to do, you know, whatever my heart wanted. And then um, I was online one day and I saw someone talk about this uh, worm dip, which is what you use when you fish and you want to dye your lures. Um, You use this liquid um, plastic dye. So it's not a powder, it's a liquid. And I was like, whoa. I ordered yeah. every single color and the second uh, and I ordered a new airbrush so I could start from scratch and not worry about anything. And that was those first dyes that I did that people were like, what are those dragon eyes? OK, and, yeah, yeah, because I was going to say, like, I remember the first month or two you were doing you were messing around with the shaving cream. You were messing around with some different stuff mm-hmm. and you were coming up with some awesome. I mean, obviously, you're a talented artist and it's hard to mess that up. But um but I definitely remember there was a, a specific point, and I think it was the alien disc. Mm-hmm. But I remember when you posted that one, I was like, holy shit, Shantae has arrived. I was like, I mean, because legitimately, and I, and I mentioned this off the air too, the dyes you're doing now, I have not seen quality like this outside of the Dymax department in Emporia. Oh, well, like, they look sublimated. And... It took me about 15 minutes of reasoning it through my head to come up with the thought that maybe you were doing airbrushing. And, and and it is, and I don't think there's a lot of people doing that with their dyes. So that brings up a couple questions to, in my mind. One, does your airbrushing equipment, because I've dabbled with it uh, some in different forms. I mentioned sneakers. I did that a little bit mm-hmm. when I was younger. Um, I imagine that the the materials, the the pigments that you're using for disc dyes are much different than the the pigments and the materials that are normally passed through your typical airbrush machine. So so it works completely different in those airbrushes. So do you have to have specialized equipment or does it gum up the works and that and make and cause like a big like upkeep? Yeah, it's a a constant battle. Um, I have to basically treat my um, airbrush like my baby like I have to be very meticulous with it because I'm running and you know an acetone you know chemical through it at all times it, it erodes I have to change up the needle a lot I've got to you know do all that kind of stuff um, but because of that I've learned to add cert like not as much acetone add a little bit more alcohol you know and play with my different ratios to see you know what works better mm-hmm. um, there's a new dye that like I just got introduced to that I haven't had a chance to play with yet. And it's called pro chem, but it's back into powder form, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to use it. I'm going to try, but it has like 14 new colors that are like amazing. So if I could achieve it, uh, the type of dyes that are going to come off from that are going to be amazing. But right now I'm only working with very elementary colors. Mm-hmm. Like just your basic colors and everything you see, like just the skin on this one right here. See, I was about to say, because the two Ooh. things that really strike me and hold that up close to the camera, because the two things that really strike me about your dye work are one, the lines to the shading. Mm-hmm. Both are very precise, but the lines really stand through in the Pennywise disc. You can really see the markings on his face. The All the lines are super, super crisp and very, very precise and complex. And the fading, however, the shading really shines up more in the nun disc. Mm-hmm. And 
both are kind of opposite ends of a spectrum of difficulty that you encounter when you're trying to do this kind of work on this kind of material. Mm -hmm. And like, for instance, her face color, you know, that I had to use three different colors. To make something that resembles flesh. Right. So I use... White person flesh. Yeah. And you use pumpkin... Dead white person. Undead white person. And it's colors you wouldn't think of. It's pink. It's pink, brown, and yellow. I mean, that makes sense. Yeah. But, you know, like is in worm dip, you know, you like... It's, it's, they're so concentrated. Yeah. You know, so you're talking just drops to achieve a color. Um, so I become, you know, a scientist in the lab with that. Yeah. That's a totally, uh, uh, like a fourth dimension to the visual art. Yeah. And don't but, forget acetone eats through everything. Oh, yeah. So, like, you have to be careful. And you have a lot of animals in your house. That's got to be a constant yeah. battle is yeah. to make sure you're not, you've got to have like some pretty strenuous protocols to keep things out of the wrong hands i think my children make more messes with my art stuff than my animals <laughs> well surely i mean they are children but you know they they tend to have a little bit more of a, a, a i would say a hesitancy when it comes to ingesting chemical products yeah probably yeah i think the worst is the cat knocking over plants into things and then that knocking over something uh, and yeah, now yeah, i have yeah, yeah. I have goo gone oil with plant soil and acetone. Hey, yeah, it was great. That's a nice soup. Yeah. It's like a New England yeah. clam Oh, chowder, and that was all red. over like those metal rivets that you like go into <laughs> like <laughs> towels. It was great. Oh, man. Um, so how about that as a, as a next topic? The difficulties of maintaining a real world life as a visual artist. And because the, I mean, I think most of the audience can probably relate to real world struggles for disc golfers. Yeah. But, you know, we just kind of brushed the tip of the iceberg on some of the difficulties that can happen in a household environment when you have art supplies well, at a you know, large I'm scale. Well, I'm, I'm not a single mother. I am married, but yeah. I'm a solo parent. Um, I have four children, um, four boys, teenage boys. And, you know, with the pandemic, you know, it's, they've been homeschooled. Um, only one goes, has been back to school for the last month. Um, so they've all been home and I've went to school full time. So it's been, uh, and I moved. So it's been quite an adventure to still find time to be creative and invent these things. And and you're also running one of the biggest disc golf clubs in the country. <laughs> With, with six wonderful people. <laughs> yes, yes. And they are wonderful people, but that, you know, you, you have to remind yourself that they're wonderful people from time to time. I know the struggle well. Mm-hmm. I know the struggle well. We are actually I have been on the struggle a bus. great team this year. I mean, I'm not saying other team, the other years weren't, you know, good, but we've all like been, the, like, it's been great. No, oh, it's always a random smorgasbord and then you yeah. guys hit your stride. And Oh, yeah. Um, it's, it's been really good. Um, I got to say, they have been amazing all of my team members for the board, we have really um, come together. We can, we've been agreeing on things like really, I feel like we've got a lot accomplished. We've done a lot of forward progression, you know, for the club um, this year. Um, I think, you know, the fact that NT is coming up, you know, I think it's just going to be amazing. You know, I'm just, I'm just really glad that after a year of quarantine and how disc golf kind of like, slow down and stuff that we are able to just come back into it. So full force and, you know, be a cohesive, you know, team. Yeah. And if I can say nothing else about my time with the board, uh, I will say one, it is probably the most intensive learning experience I've ever put myself through. I mean, I, I know so much now that I didn't know when I first started running tournaments, all because of my involvement with the club. And that's, yeah. that's huge. Uh, but if, but the, also the other thing is what it really, I mean, and obviously I don't, I want to be very clear. I'm not literally drawing a parallel between running a disc golf club and being in the armed forces, but to actually dig into a trench with your peers and your colleagues and go through some really, really trying, really, really strenuous experiences together towards a common goal and to learn each other's tendencies and characteristics and mannerisms and have ha, uh, be able to apply extra grace where it's applicable, mm-hmm. you know, all of those things. It, it's, a, it's a balancing act that makes you a better member of society. It makes you better at working with a team. Mm-hmm. And, and you develop 
the people that I served on the board of directors with over four years are those. No matter where we end up, there those will will always be some of the closest relationships that I ever have. Yeah, in, in I my mean, life. you you said you know like the armed forces, and I mean the one way I would relate that would be the fact that it's a volunteer position. <laughs> so there you go, you're volunteering for mm-hmm. it. You're absolutely underappreciated. Um, you know, I mean, people might say that they appreciate us, you know, but you do the good ones will come up and tell you thank you yeah they will um you know but overall it's like you hear more of what you've done wrong instead of what you've done right um you know um every bag tag you know you're there from 6 a.m to 6 p.m at least at least (laughs) um you know and that's if you're trying to beat dr hoy to the park (laughs) i get there the same time as he does (laughs) well good luck i was never able to oh no no (laughs) him and i we we're always the first ones there uh, you know, but you know, we're you know, we we're there, and we we do this because we love the sport and we love our community. Um, and I mean, we spend. We always say we're going to have an hour board meeting. It's always an hour and a half, two hours. I mean, golly, I wish I ever was a part of a two hour board meeting. <laughs> that was the worst part of the whole thing was the board meetings. And I think Alan would echo that sentiment. The board meetings. It was, I mean, first of all, to get everybody because before Zoom and the pandemic, I mean, it was wrangling cats trying to get seven people with busy lives yeah. in, in a room together to talk about some stuff and make decisions without and, zoom i don't think we still would be able to do that yeah i'm sure yeah. it helped i mean it but does. it also it adds a difficulty because now it's all kind of weird and disjointed and somewhat removed from the normal you know what i mean interaction well, yeah, that you, have. you can't just talk like we are right, right now you have to like wait and like try to like get yourself in there and you know and you just have an agenda that you're trying to get through and so sometimes it can be hard to not take too t- long right to talk and then about that things. was always the double-edged sword of it was one if you are actually able to get all seven board members in a room together good luck getting through everything on the agenda because every single time you get to a new item on the agenda one person in the group is going to want to stop everything to ask a question about something that's in item 12 <laughs> and and then you're constantly just saying okay yeah we're going to get there let's talk about this right now and everybody can see the agenda while you're talking about it. So it's not like you're asking yeah. for a whole lot. Let's stop here before I start yeah. grinding my gears. But I think, <laughs> yeah, but I think, that, you know, I think it's good for the public to also know and for everybody to know that, you know, yeah, it's we, hard. we love everybody. <clears throat> and, you know, um, it's just it's really hard. It's it's. Sometimes it feels like it's a thankless job, but we do it because it we definitely absolutely, is a thankless job. But we do it because we absolutely love everybody. Somebody's got to. Yeah, and we we want to do it, and you elected us to do it, so we're trying to do the best we can. And on the note of things that go uh, into the job that people don't ever get a chance to see, you know, this is one of the intangibles that was always a part of my job when I took the reins of the club over from Alan Posey. Was in addition to running the 30 events a year and being the one that's ultimately responsible for all of that, and in, in addition to raising enough money to take care of course projects that need to get done, and in addition to the million other working parts, you've got to uh, not lose your train of thought. Don't lose your train of thought, Will. Um, okay, this here's where I was going. Coffee. We're going to have to get some more of that on the break. Um, but no, it's... Like one of the things that I always had to do was when I first joined the board or and ran for a position on the board of directors, it was all, I had a specific list of goals that I hoped to accomplish and a certain amount of time that I knew I might be able to commit to it before I was ready to kill people. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it was one of the things that you have to do every year is constantly be looking for the standouts and the outliers, the people that are putting in more effort and or have more of a knack for this sort of thing and, and be identifying them and grooming them to some extent mm-hmm. w- through conversations and through building relationships with the, with those people is by identifying the people that are capable of doing the job and then easing them into it before they get terrified and run away and move to another city and never come around to a bag yeah. tag again. You know, it's one of those things it's, I am over the moon with the way the board has shaped up this year. I think the right people are there. I think one thing that you can point to that I don't know how many other clubs, if any, can can say this. Seven-member board, basically half of the of our board of directors is women. Yeah. Three out of four. Mm-hmm. You, Ruthie, and Danielle. Yeah. And you guys are powerful women in your examples in your community, your inspiration to a lot of people, all three of you. 
um, and, and you for the reasons that you're you're here on the show tonight. But you know, th- this is uh, I couldn't be more excited. You know, and it was four years of me not only trying to get things that done that I had on my on my agenda, but also kind of cultivating an environment and a situation that where I could walk away and not be afraid that the whole thing was going to spiral out of control. Yeah. And, and you guys are doing a phenomenal job. And as is always the case, you are encountering setbacks and difficulties and hurdles that there was no way to anticipate, you know, and, and I think it, all of the people that ran this year that were nominated, I think any person on that list would have been great. Absolutely. You know, to be on the board. Um, And I think that as a community, we are absolutely blessed with the fact that we have so many strong people who are willing to stand up and be leaders. Mm -hmm. And so I think next year, um, you know, we haven't said anything, you know, firm on um, what we're going to do exactly, but um, I think we need to add some people. So, or have some roles in some other ways, you know, to help things because we're growing so much that seven people is just, turning out to be just not enough this has always been the difficulty and we yeah. have talked about expanding the board yeah. and ratifying the bylaws i mean it's still being talked about so we're trying to figure out what's best um but you know i can see that if we make that decision and we go that route um we have people that are going to be able to stand up and actually help and, I, and we're not going to be afraid to ask you know for people i think it's going to be okay we're not going to have to coerce people to want to lead or you know convince people i think it's becoming something that people want to be a part of for yeah, sure absolutely it's an example to it's a lot to be of proud people of. it is it yeah. is it's definitely something to be proud to represent and it's also you know this is going to i don't know when you're talking about a 200 member board or a 200 member club seven people that's about the, I mean, the limits of where you can comfortably manage people with a seven member team. Mm-hmm. And so obviously now we've been flirting with 400 for the last couple of years and we have really been leaning into our committee structure for all these years and, and trying to appoint people to do things outside of being a voting member of the board. And I think the ultimate solution to the, these growing pains is some combination of the two. I think it's really applying some structure to the committee format that our current bylaws allow for, but also expanding by at least two people. I think a nine member, a a, a board of directors with nine voting members and really fleshing out the committee structure. I think that can at least provide some infrastructure for sustainable growth for the next few years. Uh, While a detailed list of ratifications that could be made to the bylaws is, is actually completed. Yeah. <clears throat> that's just my two cents. Yeah, so. I agree. I think that there's a lot of those things to look at, at and explore and figure out what's the best, you know, um, organic move mm-hmm. for the club yeah. for next year um, without like doing too much too fast. You know, there are a lot of changes that took place this year. So we're trying to just adjust a little bit and um, get a grip, you know, get grounded on that and then take on the next thing for next year. Yeah. But I think there's a lot of good things in the future. Um, we're setting up things so that the club can flourish and grow, you know, to its best ability. Mm -hmm. And so in addition to your business growing and your repertoire uh, (laughs) to be uh, in line with the thematics of your French uh, kind of theme on Enchanté (laughs) uh, repertoire. uh, So obviously you're expanding your, your portfolio and your capabilities artistically and um, administratively with running the club. But you've been running events, too, yeah. clinics and tournaments and leagues and all sorts of stuff. Yeah, we've been uh, growing. Um, and you just got a cert- became a certified dental assistant, and you're about to help Neil Finnegan with his business. And you're, dude, and you got six kids and 20 dogs and, dude, what? You just, uh, I guess, put one foot in front of the other and do what you got to do every day. Yeah, I guess. Like, I try not to think about everything that's on my plate because when I do, I get a little overwhelmed. So I have to say, what can I do right now? What do I have control over right now? And, you know, tackle that and, you know, every day try to tackle more and more. But, um, you know, I think that sometimes, you know, I had to learn an important lesson recently where you can make responsible choices and do what you think is right in the moment and then come to realize that maybe that path was not the right path. And that was for me for, you know, dental assisting. I got 
um, I followed through with it and I did it to my best of my ability and achieved, you know, I was proud of myself that I did it through everything. But I also realized that um, it was killing my hands and I've had so much issues with my hands that um, my doctors like talking about like joint replacement and fusing joints and all these things. And I had to have a, you know, really, you know, real moment with myself and say, you know, what are you doing? You know, and why are you doing it? And is it the right move for your overall happiness and future? And um, I had to be real with myself and say, you know, as much as I thought I was doing the right path, and I, you know, I chose something and I follow through with it. I don't think it was the right path for me. And so um, I had to humble myself and say, instead of being prideful, say, well, I'm going to keep on doing this, you know, even though I know I made a mistake because I, you know, made a commitment, I finished my school. But now I'm like, you know, um, art is really like creating is where my happiness and my soul is. And I don't want to waste my hands on something that doesn't benefit that you're not on fire about exactly yeah. you know i'm about to be 41 years old and um you know i don't know what tomorrow brings so i've lived enough taking care of my children and being you know moving around military wife for the last 17 years i made it had to make a you know a soul-wrenching decision where i was like i i need to do something for myself like that is gonna make my soul sing and um, I was still going to do the dental stuff. I didn't even think not to until um, I met, uh, you know, Neil Finnegan, Finnegan and um, his wife and I sat oh, down. I was about to break into the chorus of Tim Finnegan's wake. <laughs> <laughs> what up, Neil? <laughs> Golf snaps for Neil. Yep. <laughs> and his wife and I, um, she um, had this business called Rescued Relics, um, where she'd get storage units or like all sorts of auctions and stuff like that and like um, churn things and, and, and sell, you know, sell antiques and stuff like that. And um, for anybody who's watched shows of those kind of, you know, like road pickers yeah any yeah. of those you always know that Botswana and pickers yeah i don't know if that's there's a thing yet that but knows, travel channel yeah. you step up your game exactly and you know there's always the person that knows the antiques the person that knows how what things are worth and then there's always the restoration person yep. there's always the artist on the side that like takes the stuff that needs to be like upscaled or it's not really worth anything but you can put art on it and make it worth something that's me now that's dope. Yeah. So her and I are um, with the big old shop that I just bought at my new house, you know, turning it into uh, Relics Rising. And, and I know you as a per, uh, you know, just personally, uh, because I know you as, as a friend, but also most artists are this way, I think, but really given to the sentimentality of, of things. Absolutely. And, Everything has a story. Right. And being, and finding that attachment and identifying with the story or the soul of an object. Absolutely. And bringing it out and, and bringing it into a way, that, into a spot where other people can appreciate it. Absolutely. Like there's this, uh, that's right in your wheelhouse. Exactly. And it's so crazy. Like, so there's houses being built right in front of my house that I just bought, even though my house was built in 1979, the guy bought like most of the land up and is developing it. Mm -hmm. So I get to keep six acres. So they're building all these houses and I'm seeing these piles of incredible wood being burnt and just they're burning them everywhere and i'm just like what is happening like why are you burning that wood and they were like well we don't we can't use it we don't want to haul it off it cost us too much money to haul it so we're just burning it and i'm like looking at this and this is like amazing wood it's like watching a pile of books burn <laughs> yes i felt so i felt like i was watching a funeral like these 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 pieces of wood weren't good enough to go into a house. So they were turning them into carbon again. And it was I was cold. Just, oh, I yeah. just couldn't handle it. So I like said, give me all your wood. And he was like, I will give you all the wood from all the houses. And so, I mean, all of the wood. And I'm getting these. There goes the neighborhood. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so, me and the boys, like, started gathering all like the that, wood. Like that insurance commercial where you got the guy in the car and is like, who just throws away a bunch of pallets? <laughs> I know. Like, I was like, who does this? This is insane. It's murdering my lawn. <laughs> like, 
<laughs> so we were like, the kids and I were like going through all the wood and they were so excited. They're like, you could do this, mom, you could do this. And they were just like, they were getting so creative with it because they were like geometric pieces, you know, perfectly cut because of the houses. Right. So they were, they were making art on the ground right there. Just well, like just trying to harvest it. Yeah. Uh, just, just, and I'm just like, this is awesome. Oh yeah. This is going to be great. This was meant to be. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the stars have aligned. Yeah. Pretty per- pretty perfect. Mm-hmm. I think Eric Oakley would say, is that good? <laughs> uh, and then, I mean, speaking of just perfect, I mean, like, so I dye these two discs and um, I mean, I didn't even think I was going to even have time to start dying recently because I've still been moving. I haven't even closed on the house yet. It, lots of problems went wrong, but I haven't even done that yet, um, even though I'm moving. And... Um, I sat down because I said, I need some me time. I needed to find some me. And I decided to dye a disc. And the Pennywise disc I posted. And this this influencer on Instagram reaches out to me today. And she's um, these, like, I guess, like, she runs a magazine of, like, horror art. And oh, that's dope. she wants to... Um, uh, she says, like, I want to promote you and I want to do a half a page uh, layout on you and your art and have a whole bio on you and I'll put you on my Instagram, my Facebook, all this stuff. And I'm just like, whoa, like, what's happening? Dude, that's huge. That's awesome. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank that's, you. That's big golf snaps for Shantae on that <laughs> one. Um, yeah, man. I mean, your stuff is so good. I'm going to do this again. What is, what is this on? That one's a diamond. A diamond. I love it. Yeah. So we'll see. Oh, this right here. Yeah, so check this out, folks. Look at this bad mamma jamma. Is that not spooky? And look at the detail. I'm going to hold it up extra, extra close so you guys can see these lines as the camera focuses. But, <laughs> I mean, look at the detail on this. This is something truly, truly impressive. Now, you are you are coming to DDO. Yes, yes. So, we're, we're, a bunch of us are making the trip, I think. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, I, I'm super excited are, because. Are you going to play? Oh yes. And are you also going to vend? No, I'm no, not. No, you're not going. Not vending at all. No, but I, a lot of people asked me if I was bringing anything. I can get you a table. We'll talk about that. Okay. Okay, because I don't have enough. You know, I'm on the event staff, right? Oh, I didn't know what your position was in the, in the event. <laughs> I got Dougie Fresh on speed dial right now. I'll get you a table. Well, I have to have inventory on that table, so we'll see. Let's talk. Yeah, we'll talk about it. Um, one of the things I'm super excited about. Oh, I'm still about, soloed on me. <laughs> <laughs> just you had to appreciate all this for just an extra minute. I don't do that very often unless I'm showing something else off and then I forget about it. And I'm embarrassed. If any of you guys are going to DDO, um, please please check out the... Um, I, I'm not going to be... Um, featured on there um i'm gonna be around um and so you can pick my brain if you want i have no problem ever giving people pointers or hints or anything but um there's gonna be the die academy um you can still buy some tickets i think there's still some available um there'll be a different artist um for each um event um one's like uh, tiffany shaw she's amazing at poor dyes and uh, i call her the queen of dying she really is phenomenal um and then you have um tim and you have a whole bunch of other people that are going to be really good there so you can buy a ticket and learn how to die from them that is dope yeah that is dope um so i mean how many people are see that's one of those things though is i mean like be, when you flood the market with all kinds of artistic and creative people, though. I mean, you're just getting more ways of doing things. You're offering more different lines of thought to the general public. And I think there's a market for everybody. On Thursday, where all the artists are getting together for a barbecue at one of the Airbnbs to finally meet in person. We've been like sharing all these dyes on the Disc Dyers page, but we've never met. That's awesome. And for the first time, most of us get to meet together. And so it's, I'm super excited about that's, it. That's really cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yes, let's definitely talk about getting you some vending going on. And um, we're going to take a quick break to go to the bathroom, refresh our beverages and all that stuff. But when we come back, I want to talk to you about management because obviously for a, a busy people, setting and maintaining boundaries is a huge thing. And you wouldn't be able to do the enormity of everything that you do if it wasn't for boundaries and being able to have some sort of a structure to your schedule. And I'm interested to see how that breaks breaks down and where your priorities and your motivations are. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure there's probably about a thousand other things we can talk about too. But, <laughs> um, 
Yeah, so after the after these messages <laughs> On the podcast, uh, 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 on the podcast, uh, the last cash. Pretty sure what I'm hearing right now is Davon listening to Miley Cyrus. Nope. This is Miley Cyrus in here. It's not Miley Cyrus. Oh, what's this? But you hear it, right? There's a song going in our Yeah. It's either Davon or it's the neighbor. I'm really hoping it's the neighbor because if it's Davon, I'm going to make fun of him so bad. You should find out. <laughs> I won't embarrass him on the show. I'll wait till after. But, okay, you guys at home, we just had a moment here. You can't hear it because I'm really good at editing this stuff. And you, you'll never hear anything that's quieter than negative 70 decibels. <laughs> but Shantae and I right now in our headphones can hear a pop country song by some uh, moderately talented young lady. The kind of thing you hear on the radio quite regularly. And it's being played somewhere in very close proximity to the Sapphire Lounge right now. Yeah, I can hear it in my... There's basically two options. It's either Dave on in the other room, or it's the neighbor. And I know Dave on is kind of a renaissance man, as are many of the men in his family. There, there is Golf snaps to Marcus. Burning. And there's incense <laughs> burning. There's weird things happening in the Sapphire Lounge this evening. <laughs> It, it, this is we are way outside of our comfort zone. I'm leaning on chairs. I don't know what to do with my hands. I I, I mentioned that, but I I'm 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 a man without a country. <laughs> he doesn't have his homies for his. I don't know. know what to do. Um, it, there's so much room in here now. All of a sudden, it's not hot and smelling of men's feet. Um, your wingmen's are gone. Yeah, it's weird. I don't like it. <laughs> I fear change. Uh, but no, we teased a little bit before the break. Um, you do a lot. Uh, we talked a little bit about, <laughs> we talked a lot of bit about that. But the many things that you do, it, you, how do you go about structuring your day to day? I know you kind of live in the moment and we, you talked about what can I do right now? But I, I guess if I were to narrow it down into more of a specific direction, what I'm getting at is you as a visual artist, you have a lot of different things going on that are very, very different in nature. So one is you're, you're an idea person. You are getting these static ideas from the ether and you are using your hands and the materials in front of you to bring them into manifest reality. Mm -hmm. So in order to do that, you have to stay fluid and in tune with your own intuition and, and follow the little rabbit holes. This are you floating? Chair, yeah, this chair wants Dude, to Dude, that chair is weird, right? It does. It wants to go. I gave Jay such a hard time because he shows up one day. He had his own chair, his own headphones, his own microphone. He was like, this is for me. And nobody else can play with my toys. And it, I remember when he brought that chair up the stairs, I remember, I think there was one episode where I compared it to, if I was a mafia boss... On a space station on Mars, 25, 35 years in the future from now. <laughs> this would be the chair. That would be the chair behind my desk. Well, you guys don't see it, and I'm not going to show you. <laughs> <laughs> Her feet are about this far They're off the ground. <laughs> like, so we, I can't like, stop the chair. So if you see her floating, yeah, she's so in space. I have to keep propping my feet up against the table, like legs, to stop it from moving. So, so we we tried putting the chair down low enough for her feet to touch the floor, but then she's like barely over the top of the table. Yeah. We're not going to do that again. That made me feel like maybe. Uh, you order pizza, I'll call the midgets. I'm already here in Canada. Apparently, I am a midget. 
<laughs> well, Canada, we're not even going to go. If I lose three fourths of an inch here, I am. No, oh, wow. Yeah. So when I get does old, that come with any benefits? Do you get yeah like, handicap sticker? No kidding, dude. Yeah, I need can't to get. Wait. I've got to get one of those. There is a ridiculous parking situation at my work at Vanderbilt. It's like at this point, I have nowhere to park within a mile and a half of my work that I'm not going to get a ticket because of construction and other things. So my options are. I can pay a hundred dollars a month for a parking pass to a lot that's within a mile of my shop, or I can pay forty to fifty dollars a month to park in a lot by one of the stadiums and then ride a shuttle. And I'm like, I'm not going to pay you for the privilege of riding a shittier bus when I can ride the MTA for free with my badge all the way from Bellevue. Mm-hmm. So, or I, but meanwhile, while all of this is is very very true and real for me. There are about 2,000 meter spots that sit empty all day, every day within two blocks of the medical center. And you can park in any of those for free if you have a handicap placard. So I'm like actively trying to find out some shady, illegitimate way to procure myself a handicap placard just to go to work. So I don't have to pay them 25% of my earnings back to them for the privilege of going there to work. End of rant. Um but no, so I, what I was really trying to say was, uh, one, you've got, <laughs> we're in the weeds. This always happens after the break. What is it about this? We're, we're in the glow round now on the last cash. <laughs> um, no, what I was specifically trying to get at is, is let's take two, two examples. I'll just give two random examples of things that you do. One, minis. Mm-hmm. Or no, since we're talking about your dies, we'll, we'll use the custom dies. So custom dies, you're on commission. Or actually, that makes a good third example. So you got commissions on your custom dies. People are hitting you up and saying, hey, I want this on a disc, on this disc. I want this image on this disc for this person for this reason. Mm-hmm. So not only are you trying to nail down a, an image, but you're trying to nail down the sentimentality behind it and, and the yeah. purpose of it well, and its soul and its story. Well, that's actually good that you brought that up because it's something that I've had to say I'm about to say no to. Uh-huh. I have like two commissions that I'm backed up on right now because I took a little bit of break with the moving and everything. And they were sweet enough to say, I want your die so much. I'm going to wait. Um, but it, when you do a commission, you have a set price. You know what I mean? Like you say, this is what your commission is based on the design. And then you, then you like post something like that. And then like everybody wants that design. And I'm, I'm an artist that will not do the same die twice. I will not do it a second time. So if you have one of my dies... I love my mulligan man, by the way. Good, I'm glad you do. No one else will have one of my dies of like that because I'll never do it again. One unless, of one. Yeah, one of one unless you ordered like twins, you know, done. <laughs> Which I've had some people do. Um, but, you know, it took the love actually out of... <laughs> He's a scary guy. I, I love it. Man. I love him. I just keep going back to, like I said, the lines and the shading because, and this, and every time I look at it, I, I notice something different. The shading on the reflection on his lips, like it looks wet and, and his nose and, you know, on all that, but then the eyes, because you've got definitive points of golden reflection in his eyes. And I the hang, line, I hang pan and the eyes. lines are very clean, but they look literally when you look at this, in person, it looks like his eyes are glowing. So, I mean, how much time with this airbrush method does one of these take? That that particular one... Once you know what the image is that you're going to... Because you, you talked to me a little bit off the air about your process as far as designing it on your iPad and then uh, cutting out certain... Yeah, so any given die from concept to creation is like five hours. Um, because it takes me time to c- come up with the um, image. I got to draw it out on my iPad. Then um, I will cut out um, on my Cricut cutting machine. I will cut out a outline of that image that I drew. And then I will take the airbrush and go in and airbrush it. Now it takes many layers of airbrush to achieve what you see there because um, you're having the evaporation happen through the airbrush with the acetone. And so it puts a very, very light le- layer um, on the disc. And with lots of heat and lots of layers, you finally achieve that. So you can see how it's darker or, uh, around his face, um, just on the neckline, than the outside. So I had to go over the part closest to his neck a lot more times than I did the other areas to keep that variance like that. 
That is just intense. I mean, no, it, in any way you look at that, that's just, it's a beautiful piece of art and it's a disc. And that's something that's also unique about our, our sport. Yeah. And, we and, throw art. And I think the misconception that a lot of people have with dyed disc, though, is that, um, that they're going to last forever and they're going to hang them on their walls. So anything that's dyed, you have to understand. If um, you throw it, it, it will wear. Well, you want to throw it because yeah, yeah. It, it only has a certain life. Yeah, yeah. But um, it's going to it's gonna fade. And, it's going to yeah, fade. Yeah. If it's on your wall or if you throw yep. it, it's going to fade. These things were made to fly, people. Exactly. And anybody who says it's too pretty to throw, I'm like, please don't lock up my creation in your house for no one to see and let let it fly. Please let it fly because it has a life. It has a life. And you have to think of science. That dye is in plastic just like your your tattoos will blow out eventually with time in your skin, this is even worse, and it will blow out faster than a normal than a tattoo will. So, I mean, you don't have that much time to you know to the life of a dye. So you have to really appreciate it and love it while you have it. Yeah, and I mean, talk about a labor of love. One, be, just because of the nature of our of our game, but you know, people are coming to you either for something that is important or special to them or something that's special or important to somebody that's special or important to them. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of love from many angles that goes into one of these kind of creations. Yeah. And it's... I've done a lot of people's dogs that have passed. Mm -hmm. That's those... As much as I like appreciate them coming to me to do... It's a lot of pressure. Oh, yeah. It's a lot of pressure. And... Um, much like a tattoo. Yeah. Um, and... I mean, everybody's happy. You know, I've only had one, only one uh, customer not like their dye and actually return it. But I just took that dye and posted it. And within literally five minutes, it was sold again. It was just that particular person did not like, you know, he asked for a flamingo. I did a flamingo, but apparently he wanted an up close of the eye of the flamingo. But, you know. But that's, here's the thing. I mean, and... This might be helpful for anybody that's watching. There, It's really like you're treading troubled waters when you are trying to work, when you are commissioning an artist to do something that has any kind of a corporatized or, you know, uh, business kind of uh, association to it. It's almost like I understand one and this is important for anybody that is potentially thinking of commissioning an artist for anything. It's important to understand one artists appreciate not being expected to work for free. Um, art of any kind, you're not just do, doing an hourly rate type thing. You are applying a small piece of your soul into everything that you make. And then you're selling it. It's like, it's like having a child and then selling it to someone. It's absolutely it's, like it, that. It's a piece. Every one of these is a piece of my soul. Right. You see a part of me in everything that I do. Right. How I look at things. So you trying to leverage an artist to get a better deal on a stamp for your tournament. Careful. Because now not only are you messing with somebody's money, but you're messing with something that is very, very important to them on a personal level. Yeah. So yeah. first go into those negotiations, understanding that if you want quality work, you're going to pay quality prices. That's the nature of doing business. If you can't afford it, I mean, that's the thing. Don't don't shoot for the stars if you can only afford the moon. Yeah. That's one thing to be said. It's also important, vital, crucial to be very, very clear about what it is you're looking for. <laughs> you know, and it's also important to, uh, you know, as for the artist to be willing to be open and transparent through different stages of a process if you're being paid for a commission. Say, this is where I'm going. This is what I'm thinking before you spend hours and hours doing something that somebody... And, and I, I'm saying all this because I have always had a pleasant experience working with you on anything. We, we communicate very well together. You let me know what's going on, where your head's at. And I'm able to head certain things off at the pass if they're not going to line up with the vision that I have. And at the same time, be able to point out to you, this is awesome what you're doing here. Let's elaborate on that. It's a it's a collaborative process. Yeah. So what you can't do is go to an artist and say, and have this specific image in your head of what the disc that you're looking for is, and then give them a very vague 
a, a description of what it is that you're asking them to do, and then act like you're all flabbergasted and pissed off when it doesn't come out the way you oh, had I it in your my head. Lesson. I will. I every commission after that was like question, 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 question. Yeah, I don't know. I know which one you're specifically thinking yeah, of. I yeah. wasn't necessarily going there, but I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, so like now, I always ask, you know, what I what you know is wanted, um, but. I mean, I think that everybody should just understand that when you're going for a dyed disc with art on it, it is art. It is not just a dyed, it's not just a disc. Right. It, it is not a $20 disc that you bought in the store. It has artwork on it. And if that art was on a piece of canvas, what would you be willing to pay for it? Right. So, yeah. Just think of that. So, those are all important things to note. Um, but this is, but it's also, if you find the right artist and you're able to work with them properly, you can come up with something that it makes your event truly set apart and iconic. And I think that a big, big, maybe intangibly so, but a big part of the premium that is now attached to my, a lot of my events have a big part to be thankful to you for for the visuals. I mean, some of those bell witch stamps are just, I mean, I'm still like, I, you know, I've, I've kind of become friends with the, uh, with the guy that owns the new plate again, sports, Robert. And, uh, I went in recently to talk to him and I hadn't been in the store since it opened and he's got, uh, and I was like, you got a lot of my tournament discs on, oh, on the he? wall. He's got like stuff like hanging up for just for the stamps. Oh, really? And he's got a bunch of your artwork up. <sighs> And I was like, you got a bunch of my tournaments up here. And he was like, oh, really? I was like, yeah, I did that one and that one and that one and that one and that one. And a lot of it was your stuff. But that's the thing is like, you do it right. I mean, it's worth every penny. And then Look at COVID. The one I did for for the Cane Ridge Ridge Open. Open. Yeah. Yeah. Like that one, you guys couldn't even, I think you guys reordered more. Yeah. Yeah. To fill it. Yeah. Yeah. So there's. I mean, th- this is the thing is, you know, you're going to, you need to be expecting to pay a premium to create a premium. If you want iconic visual uh, visuals for your event, you got to go to the right person. You got to pay them the money that they're worth. Yeah. And, you know, for the artist out there, um, you know, so a way that I had started with, um, you know, marketing myself as an artist um, is tell a TD that you will do the stamp for your entry fee. You know, and that, you know, that that's a good way to get in. That's what I did with, with Will at first. Um, I did that even with HB. You know, it's a way for them to be able to afford your, you know, art. But also, you know, you're starting off. You don't, you know, you don't have that, you know, reputation yet. You don't really know what you're doing yet. Um, it, there's going to be a lot of, you know you know, grace period to get used to what a stamp requires and, you know, how to draw one eff- eff- effectively for the um, design department, you know, but um, it's a good way to, you know, start to get in there without, you can't start, you know, start, can't ask a lot of money when you first start, you know, it just doesn't work that way. But I think more artists out there, I, I think they undervalue themselves. Oh, absolutely. You know, I, I there's such amazing artists in our community. And I, and I see that like a lot of people after they started seeing my involvement, you know, that I would, they start showing me their artwork mm-hmm. and that I love seeing what everybody does and, and they get all creative and they want to do more and more. And, um, Krista at Augwood. Oh my god, Yeah. She was the first person that came to my mind. Yeah. She, she undervalues how talented she really is and what she could do with herself and Matt as well yep. there. They even Philip. I mean, they're all great artists and they could be doing amazing things with their art more than they I think that they give themselves credit to do. I think that's a big uh kind of theme across the board for a lot of people is a lot of people just don't realize how attainable their dreams are. So guess what? Now I'm going to give them the opportunity. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be having, um, when I open up my house, I'm going to be having a nine hole there. And um, the tournaments I'm going to have there are going to be where you also have a dying lesson where you get to dye your own disc, learn how to do it, and uh, design your own shirt and get your own shirt in the player's package and be able to um, play with your art and be able to design things. And I'm going to teach um, how to do that at my tournaments. That is incredible. That is a great idea. Yeah. You're pretty awesome. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, so back to kind of where I was going, 
good example of a widespread of things that you do. You're being commissioned for disc dies, which you're starting to have to get a little bit more exclusive and choosy about. You're doing minis and trophies and that kind of thing. You're doing apparel and you are doing lines. So I think this is something to point out is when you talk about a line like air chains, earth or disc maidens or something like that, you are now doing two very different things. One, you've got different kinds of product that you can make kind of in a static way and do them periodically and over time. And they're available to be customized and to be used for different things. And it's kind of like a stock on hand kind of thing. So Ace is um, actually a little bit different than that. So what what I was going to try to point to was how do you like, how is it managing all these things when you have something like a line, like air chains, earth and disc, disc maidens that is ongoing and is, in perpetuity and then you're also doing things that are one of one Mm -hmm. and you're also doing things that are customized limited run type things like how does that how does that and then feel free to we can come back to that Mm -hmm. with what you go ahead and do what you were about to say first cut me off Mm -hmm. but that uh, that was just curious like how is it how do I Man, find the time to juggling, do juggling and juggle it? Yeah. And be not not missing deadlines and, and things like that. Well, <laughs> that's... To a reasonable extent. Yeah, that's the whole thing. And so that's something I'm trying to figure out right now because so many people are excited about Ace. And, um, you know, I was sponsored for um, a while and um, I learned a lot of things from that. And um, I wanted to do something a little bit different, not because one way is wrong, but because I wanted to, to help my players that I sponsor in a way that that helps themselves in their disc golf careers more than just a couple of free swags. So what I developed with ACE of the sponsored players is that they have a product box. Okay. And in that product box that they're going to sell, which we haven't launched yet, just because I haven't finished moving. But as soon as that happens, the players are going to get their stuff. So what there'll be a website that they can go to to give to like a business card to people. They get to keep 15% of everything that they sell for their disc golf careers, for their entry fees, for things to further their disc golf. And then a percentage of everything that we raise goes towards baskets for, um, you know, private courses to build the sport more and uh, to children with the, um, you know, that on the team that we have to give more disc to and all that, all those, you know, wonderful things that we like to do. But so, so it's like, they are going to create like that part. Like I don't have to go out and try to sell things because the sponsor players are going to be the ones going and like, Hey, I got a shirt. You know, if you, if you buy this shirt, then, you know, like it helps me in my tour, kind of like how tour, you know, touring pros do. They sell their discs to get money towards their tours. Well, now they can sell this merchandise, give a card with their sponsor's code on it to the website. And then the people can go to the website, buy what they want if the person doesn't have in stock what they want. And now they can get that money towards their, you know, disc golf careers as well and help them be able to go to more events and stuff like that. So if they would like to come help make the merchandise, then they get to make even more profit from it so that they can put even more towards their stuff. So it'll help me also be able to balance everything by, you know, in basically employing them to empower themselves. And that is another important lesson that we can impart to the audience. Uh, I'm always telling people this. And since I got sponsored, it's something that comes up more often. People asking, you know, what should I do to get sponsored? And the first place, the first place I go is always, well, understand what sponsorship is, you know, because I think a lot of people have just this assumption that you get to wear a shirt and they let you do it for free. And, you know, it's like, you you get free stuff or they pay your entry fee and you just wear their, wear their clothes and throw their, their Frisbees. And it's not that it, it's a symbiotic relationship. It's a partnership. Yeah. You, you have to come. The whole thing has to be tailored around what is mutually beneficial for the sponsor and the sponsee. Yep. And I think that that is something that a lot of, I think, and I'm not talking about anybody in particular before anybody draws any conclusions, I think a lot of times sponsors get away with undervaluing their sponsored athletes and their ambassadors because for one, and it it is true that to say that you are a part of something that's bigger than yourself, that does provide some benefits on its own. 
I mean, you are gaining some credibility there in, Just in a negotiation. Just an accomplishment. Yeah, being able to associate yourself with something known. that There is a benefit in that. Mm-hmm. But I don't feel that it, the benefit of that in and of itself is worth giving yourself away and your ability to market yourself away freely. I don't feel that that is worth it alone. And the game has changed at, a, at this point due to certain things that have happened where the sponsorship is changing in disc golf and, and people are understanding what they are worth. And, you know, this is the thing is what are you bringing to the table? Not what can I do to get this person to sponsor me? What are you doing? What is it about you that makes you an interesting candidate for sponsorship? Because it's not just scoring. It's not you, you going out and performing well at a tournament. It's not how many tournaments you're running. Even it's, it's a combination of a lot of things. It's are your values in line with the values of the company that you're hoping will sponsor you. It's, are you a good representative of what they are trying to promote? Do you line up at all in those regards? That's an important consideration that a lot of people don't take into account. And then beyond that, you know, you got to think, what is your brand? What is you, what is you as a brand? You know, because that's the thing is you're going to attract way more sponsorship if you are somebody that is willing to hustle, because look at, and I use the, these two people as an example quite a bit because they're friends and I feel like they won't get too mad at me, but Eric Cantina, they've got a brand, multiple brands. Dynamic Disc supports them because they are becoming a part of something else as well. That It's diversifying for, for Dynamic Discs. Mm-hmm. So Eric Cantina already have a product and a brand and a following and an, in, and a, and a, an influence, a position of influence. So that, that's just all things to take into consideration when you're talking about sponsorship. But it is always really encouraging for me to talk to somebody who is sponsoring people and is thinking about it in a creative and innovative way right, and trying a, to provide value to their spot. Like, yeah. you know, why are, other than, hey, wearing my shirt and you get to say you're on a team. Right. And that, that was actually something that was brought up to me where, like, you know, I had someone come up to me and was like, um, can you like can you help me get a sponsorship going? Like I want to sponsor people, and it's like, okay, well, why would someone want to be sponsored by you? Like that's something like you have to ask yourself. Like, why would people want to be sponsored by me? What do I have to offer someone that they would want to give me their loyalty and be sponsored by me? Like, what am I providing them? Mm-hmm. You know, because am I just going to use them? You know, just because I want them to be like free advertising and marketing and bring people to me, or am I trying to do something truly for them that will better themselves? And it's a huge opportunity to develop the future characters of our sport. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Like, you never know when somebody that's in your backyard is going to blow up and go on a tear. And if you have been good to that person and you've developed a relationship, they're going to be happy to represent what you're doing yeah. and help you promote. Like, I pay one event. For each of my um, sponsored players, like they can choose which one they want as long as it's not one of the over $100 A tier ones yet at this point because I'm just not at that level yet. But, you know, I will help them in that way, like get those on there. And I've done that with multiple of my players, you know, to help them get into events so that they can grow their, you know, their their careers. Yeah. You know, give them discs, give them, you know, gear. Yeah, but more like it's almost like a development deal exactly mm-hmm. you're you're you are you're investing in these players because you see potential in them like stone smith like he was one of my first sponsored players um when i relaunched everything because like that he's just an amazing player you know he's got that gun ho attitude and you know i didn't think that he was being valued you know and seen properly mm-hmm. and i wanted you know to help him achieve what he was you know trying to achieve and so we started um, to work on a partnership together. I, he reminds me a lot of Nico. <laughs> yeah, I always compare him. He's like Nashville's Nico. But and, and, and I'm not saying anything specific. I'm just saying in, in and of the fact that people, he's just somebody that's fun to watch. Mm-hmm. You never know what he's going to do. And he's going to set a course record. And you never know when he's going to blow up. You know, uh, he's right now he's in that spot where he's capable of anything. And it's going to be really interesting to watch how he develops oh, as, a, as a person because he's still very young and as a disc golfer because he's still very young to disc golf. Mm-hmm. I remember showing up at Seven Oaks one day, not knowing who he was. And he was this skinny kid standing in the parking lot with no shirt on. And he had khaki shorts 
no belt, and he had like some high top socks with some dad sneakers and curly little mop, little short mop on top of his head, and some real big glasses on, looking around like like a kid at like that was hoping to get picked for the team in the Sandlot. Like is what he reminds me, it reminded me of. And now he, I've watched him become. Like he's becoming a man. Yeah, and, and look, I have him running um, Aces uh, Sunday events yeah. on, at Cedar. You know, and I was you're giving him room to grow. Exactly. At first, you know, I stood there with him, you know, teaching him things, and now I don't even have to be there. Yep. He's just growing, you know, and you know, some people just need somebody to believe in them. Yeah. And look what they can achieve. Absolutely. I mean, he's doing it all on his own. It's not like I helped. With, you know, just give him a little help. Yeah, and you know that's how this whole thing works. Like we're all. And we all should be anyway. And I'll and I'll say this because for long the longest time in disc golf it was this tribal territorial mindset where, you know, the the goal was get whatever slice of the pie you can and protect it at all costs mm-hmm. and keep everybody away from it. That's your pie, right? And and that thankfully that's going by the wayside, but there are still a lot of people that have been in operation within the sport for a long time and they they still kind of tend to cling to that. And I'm a rising tide raises all ships guy. You know, I'm, I'm a, we're in this together. Let's there's, there's a way I guarantee you, even if like our business models put us in direct competition with each other, I guarantee you there's a way for us to work together always, you know, and make things better for both of us and not either one of us has to lose. There's so much for everybody. There's no reason. Yeah. And it's just kind of silly at some point. Well, that's but, why I like with my distine, I don't do what other people do. Because there's no reason to. If yeah. I can do something different, then I should. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's also, and it's also important, especially at a time when the game is evolving at such a rapid pace. It's important to stay fluid and to be looking to what what trends are currently coming down the pipes. Because it's just the way of the uh, the way of things is right now. You know, you're looking at players incrementally over time are expecting more and more and more from their sponsors. But, you know, obviously, in turn, sponsors are free to, if they choose to provide those things, to expect more and more in return. Absolutely. And But that's the thing, is always trying to find that balance. Because you never want to be, you don't want to be the person that signs a contract and ends up regretting it. I think the only thing that I would want to be less than that is be a person who sponsors somebody. And then five to ten years down the road, that person is going around telling other people in the industry, what a negative experience they had working with you. And that's just all that if you want to have staying power in this game, you got to be kind of always forward thinking and trying to stay ahead of the curve. And here's the big one. Don't do people dirty. (laughs) Even if they give you lots and lots of chances to, if that's, if, if you have an opportunity to move up, level up a little bit, but you're stepping on somebody else to get there. I guarantee you, even if the immediate gratification seems to justify it, it is not worth it in the long term. You are cutting your feet out from underneath you because the only equity and the only currency that any of us have in this game is our network and our reputation. You know, people know your character, people know what your intentions and your motivations are. And that's going to determine your level of success and your staying power. Absolutely. I mean, if you run around ripping people off right and left, Nobody wants to work with you or you're cutting, you're handicapping people that choose to work with you by demanding exclusivity on all sorts of stuff or any, anything like that. It's even if it's helping your bottom line in the here and now it's <laughs> you're, 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 you're crippling yourself in the long term. So, um, so yes, coming to DDO, maybe bringing some stock. We're going to talk about that. Uh, I don't know if everything's finalized for the block party, but if anybody can get you in, it's me. (laughs) So um, then is there anything else that you would like to put out on the airwaves and kind of hype up or build some buzz on while, while we've got you on the air? Um, so at the new house, what we're going to be having is the uh, events where we're going to have people learning to be able to die disc and be able to, you know, um, create their own apparel and things like that. So that's going to be something that's going to be exciting to have for the community. Um, A lot of people have been asking about workshops and how to do things. So um, I'm going to be setting up my uh, shop in a way for people to come and just get their art on 
you know, and explore in all different ways, whether it's minis and resin or it's disc dyeing or it's designing a shirt or whatever it might be. There's going to be like areas for everybody to explore that and get into their creativity. Um, and, you know, the Relics Rising that I'm getting into, we're going to be uh, having all sorts of art. You know, it's going to not just be these antiques, but it's going to be my art as well. It's going to be my canvases, furniture that I'm going to do, different lamps I might even do, just all sorts of cool stuff. So that's the stuff that's upcoming for me that I'm, I'm excited about. But um, we're going to continue on to have these tournaments for uh, I, I like to have the doubles tournaments so that it promotes, um, you know, ladies and children and men all coming together and playing. So that's kind of where I end up uh, focusing the most on these tournaments that I throw. So we're going to have another probably on uh, another one in the spring coming up. I know it's the spring, but I guess between the spring and the summer. I get it. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, all a blur. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So we're going to be having one coming up and, and I'm hoping that we have it, a lot of people come because I would really like to put more funds towards uh, building uh, some uh, putting some baskets towards some courses locally and we're, we'll have a uh, raffle so if people want to get some baskets for their courses please reach out to me message me we'll put you in that raffle and the money that we earn from the tournament will be able to raffle off that money to the the home course that will get those baskets perfecto yeah so let me confirm because i'm just noticing this now i've had this up in the scrolling text the entire episode the gmail we have sung that's mm -hmm. still how to reach out to you yep. for stuff. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. Good. <laughs> Cause that's an hour and a half of it rolling across the top of the screen. So people, you probably already got some emails, <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I've, uh, I've always been really excited um, about what you're doing and about having you available for my own purposes. <laughs> so, uh, but you know, we, we have, we have become close friends and I'm, I, I value your candor. I value, uh, you know, just us being able to share life together. And it's, it's a joy to have people that you know you can openly communicate with and and work towards a common goal together without ego and all that other tribal political bullcrap <laughs> drama in the way. It's, it's, a, it's surprisingly rare. I mean, I, you, I, I keep those relationships very, very close. I and think that would ultimately be the answer to the question that you had earlier about how do I manage everything and be able to balance everything and keep boundaries up. And that is, I'm huge on communication. Um, I constantly communicate what I'm feeling, what I'm thinking with people that I'm working with so that they understand where I'm at. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, you got to, mm -hmm. you got to. So uh, one last time, everybody, Enchante Creations, Air Chains Earth, Disc Maidens, our lost track. And Relics Rising. <laughs> Relics <now>. Rising. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, probably coming soon to the Travel Channel. I mean, they got a show for everything, right? <laughs> well, so. we are going to be uh, video doing all of our shenanigans with these sword sheds and what we do and restoring them. And we're going to be doing some stuff like that. Yeah. So. Send me some cool pictures and video clips I can add Absolutely. in on the break Absolutely. for this one. I'll be yeah. editing it tomorrow. Um, but yeah, dude, I'm I'm super excited to see what you do next. I'm excited to uh, hopefully we can, even if we don't get you a table or a booth set up for the block party, uh, I know the right people to introduce you to and we can we can help make some things happen. While Sounds you're, good. That's the great thing about Emporia for DDO. I mean, GBO slash DDO. I, I told McCabe, I was like, the only tournament with a six letter acronym. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, <laughs> The great thing about it, man, is, is one, it's a fam it's a reunion, and it's, it's like a coming together of of the disc golf family. It's my first time going. Yeah, you're gonna. So love I'm it. really going to blow excited. your freaking mind. I'm going alone. Like I, like, I know you guys are going to be there, but I'm like traveling alone. So I was like, we'll be, we'll be hanging out. Yeah, I know. But uh, you're, it's going to blow your mind. And the greatest part of it is for somebody in your position, it's in just an in, insanely invaluable networking opportunity. You're going to develop. You're, it, you're gonna it's gonna blow your mind because we, knowing disc golfers the way we do you this is just one of those unique environments where you come together and everybody's guard is down everybody is just like i'm here to hug and chew bubble gum and guess what <laughs> i'm out of bubble gum we're hugging yeah uh obviously only it, with consent pandemic and all that stuff but yeah, I'm I'm going to Emporia, and the hugs don't stand a chance. I was talking to Ben Swam in Birmingham today, and I'm like, Swammy, you better be ready, buddy. 
It's coming in hot. It's going to be fun to see even Dr. Hoy let loose a little bit, not being able to have to always be on oh, and he does. Dr. Details at every moment. I make sure to create opportunities for I him to let his hair I think both you down. and I like tag team me making sure he does. It's oh, going to be fun. Yeah. <laughs> he has become a more complete human being since his first trip with me to DDO. <laughs> he's, uh, he's, he's, it's fun to watch him caterpillar into a butterfly. It's, mm-hmm. it's pretty sweet. Yeah. Whereas Jay has always been a butterfly, and the trouble is trying to catch him in a net. <laughs> oh, in a headwind. <laughs> anyway, we love you guys. Thanks for tuning in. Like, share, subscribe, rate, review. Uh, we are all over PayPal, Venmo, Cash App. We got disc for sale. Holler at us. Lastcastpodcast at gmail.com. And uh, we'll, we'll catch you guys on the flip side. Bye, everyone. Oh, hey, uh, DDO. Not to, to, one last thing. One last thing. Uh, um, <laughs> Yeah, we got mics, we got lapel mics, we got the gimbal. We are going to be doing a bunch of podcast content while we, while we are in Emporia. So let us know through the group page, the Facebook page, or e- email or whatever, text message, uh, smoke signal, tin can on a string. Talk to Big Z. He's an engineer with the tin can on a string method. But let us know who you want us to, fo- to like just randomly drop in on and get a little quick interview with because they're all going to be there. And we also are planning on trying to invite a couple key people over to the hotel room at the host hotel and setting up a little mini podcast studio in there to get a little bit more intimate conversations. Which one's the host hotel? Uh, the Clarion. Okay. Yep. That's where the staff always stays. So, um, but yeah, so let us know who you want us to go talk to and annoy the crap out of while they're trying to do business. Cause we're going to do it whether they like it or not. Uh, bear heart. I'm coming for you, buddy. I'm right. When you are selling discs out the ear and, and you're building your brand, I'm going to come and draw your attention away from everybody and make you answer some annoying questions. It's going to happen. Just throwing it out there. And that's really it uh, this time. I promise. Right. Bye guys. Bye. Guys. Let the bass kick.